Good evening. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we are so incredibly thankful that the words of that hymn are true. We thank you, Lord, that for all whom you have called to be your sons and daughters, we will enjoy a future with you that is a future that contains unspeakable beauty and bliss and joy. We thank you, Lord, that after 10,000 of 10,000 years, that our joy in you will by no means be exhausted, and our knowledge of you will by no means be complete. Lord, I pray that as we wait for that day to come when we see you face to face, that you would encourage us, that you would build us up to be your people. And I pray that you would give us everything that we need in order to bring you glory in the here and now. Lord, as we continue talking about how to minister to people struggling with all kinds of sexual and gender-related sin, Lord, how I pray that you would pour out your spirit on us, that we would be a wise and discerning people and a people after your own heart. Father, as I talk this evening, I pray that you would guard my lips and my heart from saying anything that is an error. And I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified and use my words to build up your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, I'm supposed to tell my story, and I've done this many, many times before. The first time I really remember doing it publicly was uh, not long after I started volunteering with Harvest USA, uh, probably about 18 or 19 years ago. Uh, I was invited to go to a church in Maryland uh, that had a, a ministry to people struggling with different kinds of addictions. They didn't have a ministry at that point for people who were struggling with same-sex attraction. And they wanted me to come down and share my story in the hopes that some of the people uh, in that broader Celebrate uh, Recovery Addictions Ministry who were struggling with same-sex attraction would come forward and ask for help with those particular struggles. And I remember on the, on the drive down to Maryland on a Friday night, I was terrified because it had been hard enough for me uh, just a couple of years before to have walked into the doors of Harvest USA and to have told one person that I was struggling with same-sex attraction. And now I was going to talk to a bunch of strangers and share that story with them, and I had no idea how they would respond. All of the same fears that I had before began coming up. Will they think I'm not a Christian? Will they think I'm not the right kind of Christian? Will they judge me? Part of what the Lord did in His mercy was He gave me a very receptive audience, much the same as, as you all have been to me, and thank you for the many of you who have stopped to encourage me over the last uh, 12 hours. That, that people was very warm and, uh, and inviting, and as I shared my story, I began to realize something. I began to realize that I, I did, didn't have to be ashamed of what I had experienced. Because what the Lord was doing was He was actually taking something that for years had led to great disrespect for the gospel and a denigration of my body and a denigration even of my soul. And he instead turned that thing that was steeped in darkness into light. 
because it encouraged others. He did the very thing he talks about in Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul says that those things done in deep darkness, when they are brought into the light, they become light. That's one of the reasons why this morning in the plenary session and throughout the the workshops that I taught uh, this morning and this afternoon, I, I so encouraged the people in the audience to be willing to sympathize and empathize with those people whom they were counseling, whom they were pastoring, whom they were befriending. Because we need to know that we don't walk through this life and through the darkest shadows of our lives alone. And it's through walking with one another, arm in arm, to the throne of grace, to receive grace and mercy to help in our time of need, that we begin to get even the dimmest picture of what the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ looks like. So as I share this story, I give all glory and all credit to to the Lord. This is a story of my life, but it is not my story. It's a story that continues. The last chapter hasn't been written yet. And hopefully you will find it a story of God's redemption and grace. I'd like to share my own personal experiences and then talk with you uh, briefly about some ways in which I would encourage you to engage others uh, in your spheres of ministry to share their stories. So, I'm the oldest of five children. I was, I know that because when I was born, I didn't see any of the others. Uh, I was born to a working class family in Northeast Philadelphia. Northeast Philadelphia was a very, what what is the right adjective to use? Uh, A very, settled part of Philadelphia 50 years ago. Uh, It was a place where people had lived for one or two generations. A lot of the people who were my neighbors when I was growing up were in their 60s and 70s and 80s, and they had lived there virtually their entire adult lives. It was a different time back then when people were less mobile, and when you found a home and you got connected to a neighborhood and a church, that's where your allegiance lied, or lay, rather. And uh, people were happy and content. It was a simple life, and a life in which I found some joy and some sadness. Uh, as, a, as a young boy, uh, I grew up primarily under the care of my mother's mother, my my grandmother, uh, because my mother worked in order to help support us. My mother and father were married. My my father, uh, you should know, as I go throughout the story, lived at home. He and my mother were married up until the time he died 12 years ago. I I would have to say that if my mother and father were uh, the people today that they were 50 years ago, I doubt they would have remained married. They had a very complicated and, and I think, a very tortured relationship, but by God's grace, uh, they did not separate or divorce, and that provided some measure of stability for us uh, growing up. I spent much of my first five years with my, my grandmother and really enjoyed the time that I spent with her. She, she doted on me. She nurtured me. She just enjoyed spending time with me. I was the only grandchild at that time, so there was no one with whom I had to share her. And in part because my mother worked so long and so hard, and in part because of my mother's own brokenness, which made her emotionally unavailable, my grandmother became my surrogate mother. She was the one that I actually looked up to and and saw as my primary caregiver 
It was during those first five years of life that I began to notice I had some difficulties making friends. On the one hand, there weren't a lot of boys who lived around me. As I, as I mentioned, a lot of the, the, the folks in our neighborhood were older. They were empty nesters. Uh, and of the few families that lived in our neighborhood, most didn't have boys my age. So there weren't many potential friends to choose from. Uh, but the ones that I did choose, I, I struck out on for a variety of reasons. I didn't make any male friends as a child. I did make some friends, and they were all girls. And so here I am, a boy of five, who has spent the majority of his life with his grandmother, whose only friends, whose only basis for understanding what it means to be a human being uh, were, were the women around him, I began to become pretty confused. And let me, let me stop and, and just caution you to not hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that boys raised primarily by women are prone to same-sex attraction. That, that's not at all true. What I'm saying is that in my particular instance, uh, this, this was my experience. I, I loved my grandmother, I loved my girlfriends, and I began to emulate myself after them and feel more comfortable around women than I felt around men. My father, as I mentioned before, was at home while all of this happened, but he also was a very broken man and very emotionally unavailable. Uh, I, I don't have many good memories of my relationship with him growing up, and I, I don't say that to denigrate him, him or his memory in any, any way. It's simply the way things were. The first time I remember my father shaking my hand or saying he was proud of me was the day I graduated from high school. And I had deeply yearned to hear those words from my father up until that point. As a boy who was primarily socialized by women, I, I deeply yearned for male companionship. I, I deeply yearned to hear the voice of my father say, well done. I yearned to hear the voice of my father say, I'm proud of you. I love you. But those words simply didn't come easily from my father. And I would encourage you, fathers who are out there, and potential fathers, to not overlook this very important point. Your relationships with your sons will probably look very different from your relationships with your daughters. But don't fall into the cultural lie that says that boys don't need as much affirmation, as much nurture, as much love, as much affection as girls. They do. And so tell your sons that you love them. Make time to spend with them, invest yourself in them, and help them learn what it means to be a godly man after God's own heart. So I yearned for male companionship, but there was none to be found. And then there was Jimmy. Jimmy moved into my neighborhood with his mother when I was about six. Jimmy was two years older than I. His mother was divorced, and it was just Jimmy and his mother in, in an apartment around the, the block, around the corner, rather, from where I lived. And we went to the same school, and even though we were in different grades, um, somehow we met each other and became friends. And I, I really enjoyed spending my time with Jimmy. Here was a boy slightly older than I who really took an interest in me, who was really invested in spending time with me, who really showed me affection. 
it, it really warmed my young heart to, to receive that from him. Unfortunately, Jimmy's affection and, and love came with a cost. And pretty soon after Jimmy and I became friends, he began to become sexual with me. And over the course of the next year and a half, Jimmy molested me on a regular basis. And I can't tell you, because I don't have many distinct memories from that long ago, I can't tell you exactly what it was like to go through that experience. But I can tell you this. The experience of deeply desiring to be loved and the experience of the, the closeness and intimacy that a sexual encounter brings impacted my view of what it looked like to be loved by another man. And I began to, to associate sex with love, at least so far as it came to relationships with boys. I don't know the circumstances of Jimmy's departure, but he and his mother left abruptly about a year and a half after we met. I felt lonely. And in part, to soothe my loneliness, when I discovered my father's stash of pornography, a few months later, I quickly turned to it as a way to comfort my soul and to find in my fantasies the kind of peace and affirmation that I so, so much yearned for. Even though my father's pornography was heterosexual in nature, I was able to insert myself into the fantasies and latch on to the, the male figures in those pictures and in those stories and imagine that I was there with them. Do you know how pornography warps a child's mind? Do you know the damage it does? for a child. It does enough damage for an adult. Psychiatrists and psychologists have proven this. But to a child who doesn't have the emotional framework within which to understand what he or she is seeing, it has a profound effect, not only on that child's impression of themselves, but on the way that they view other people. The few friendships that I had became almost superfluous to me because I was turning to that pornography on a regular basis for all of my interaction, all, all of my relational need, all of my comfort. I became withdrawn, I became sullen, I became depressed. One of the things that contributed to my depression was the fact that all the while this was going on, I was a Christian. This is a hard thing to explain, but I first remember having a relationship with Jesus when I was five. Even though I don't believe either of my parents was a believer, we went to a small Lutheran church in our neighborhood. And I just remember as a child loving to go to that church, loving to hear God's word read, loving to sing the hymns. I remember that I began reading a Bible by myself as a child. I began praying by myself as a child. I would go to church even when no one else in my family would. I would sit there in the pew by myself. And I remember having this image, 
as, as a five-year-old of needing to move over in my seat because Jesus needed room to sit down with me. And I am so thankful to my Lord that he gave me that, that image of what it looked like for him to be present with me because I think if I didn't have Jesus, I surely would not be speaking to you now. I'm sure that at some point along the way, I would have self-destructed. So as a believer, and, and in my immature understanding of what Scripture said about homosexuality, I, I knew enough to know that it was wrong. I knew enough to know from reading Scripture that the way that I was attracted to other boys was an abomination to God. And I began to feel intensely afraid. I began to feel intensely afraid that I would lose my salvation, that God would be disappointed with me, that my parents would reject me. And that fear, in part, spurred me on to more and more sexual sin. You know, I, I felt so ill at ease. I felt so afraid of God's wrath that I turned to pornography and fantasy more and more and more in order to comfort myself. I can even remember around the age of 12, I made a bargain with God, the first of, I'm sure, thousands. And I promised God that if he would forgive me, I would never, ever, ever again look at pornography or masturbate. And I felt sure that that was a good bargain. I felt sure that God would be pleased with me for wanting to turn away from sin. And I felt proud of myself for, for several days. But as the time went on, the yearning for the comfort of that pornography grew stronger and stronger and stronger. And eventually I gave in. And I was convinced at that point I had lost my salvation. I had broken my promise to God. And what other recourse could there be except that he would condemn me to hell? I know this might sound like a child's incoherent babblings, but for me, it was very real and it was very terrifying. It added to my despair, it added to my depression. I, I worked from that point on in my life feverishly to try to somehow balance the ledger in my account with the Lord. I tried to have at least as many check marks in the good column as in the bad column, because I figured at least if it were equal, God probably wouldn't send me to hell. There were many, many, many times in my teens and 20s when I would drop to my knees weeping and ask the Lord to take away my same-sex desires. There were many, many times when I promised God again and again, this will be the last time, I'll never do it again. There were many, many times that I took the pornography that I had access to and moved it, hid it, threw it away. So I couldn't have access to it again. But I found that that really didn't stop the compulsion that I had to keep going back to it. As I went through my teen years, I was increasingly depressed, 
I became suicidal on several occasions. I remember, as a matter of fact, staying home from school one day. I was, I was depressed. If, if you've ever been depressed, you know you do things like this. Uh, you just can't bear to be around people. And I couldn't explain this to, to my mother, so I made up an excuse that I was sick. Uh, and she had to go to work, so I was home by myself. And I remember sitting there deciding that I needed to kill myself because I was such a horrible person. Forgive me if this is too graphic for you, but I actually got a knife and held it to my chest and was ready to end my own life. But Jim Baker was on TV. And I forget exactly what he was saying, but the Lord used it to break me down into tears. And obviously, I didn't follow through on my intent. I put the knife away. But I didn't continue with any more hope. I was convinced that I was, at best, a second or third class Christian because I just couldn't get my act together. And at worst, I was condemned to hell. As I went through my teen years, that, that process of going through periods of depression continued. I had my first sexual encounter with another man, consensual encounter, that is, uh, when I moved out on my own. I was 21. And just like every other incident in my life, I was so filled with shame and regret after I had gone through with it that I promised God I would never do it again. And I stayed clean for about six months and then gave in. And then the interval between uh, that fall and the next grew shorter, and between the next one grew shorter still. And I got to the point where I was addicted to sex. I never knew any of the men with whom I had sex. They were all anonymous. And they were all anonymous because I wanted to keep it that way. I couldn't bear anyone in my real life knowing what had gone on. I, I couldn't stand the judgment. I couldn't stand what they would think, what they would say. I didn't want to take any chances. So every encounter I had was anonymous. You know, in Scripture, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6 that when we engage in a sexual encounter with someone else, we become one flesh with them. And that's one of the reasons why he says in that passage that to sin sexually is a different kind of sin because you sin against your body. In a sense, what you're doing is you're taking that part of you which is meant to be united to one other and only one other, and you give it to multiple people. You keep using it over and over and over and over again. And every time you do that, you give away a little teeny tiny part of your soul. And the more times you give it away, the less real you there is left. And that's how I became. After years of doing this, I, I was literally dead inside. I had lost my affection for the Lord. I had lost any hope that anything would ever change. I, I gave up praying that God would ever change me. And I remember it was Christmas Eve, I'm sorry, Christmas Day, 1995. I just spent the day as, as I typically did on Christmas with my family and then went home to be by myself in my apartment. And at that time, 
One of the TV networks uh, showed It's a Wonderful Life every Christmas evening. And I turned it on and watched that sappy story of good old George Bailey having all of these friends who loved him and being a part of this huge community. And I felt utterly alone because I knew that I was living a lie. I had ostracized myself from God. I had ostracized myself from other people. I had no hope. And so I, I can remember as clearly as if it were yesterday. I sat on the floor weeping, and I told God I was done with him. I told him that I was sick and tired of feeling guilty and ashamed, and I wasn't going to do it anymore. I told him that if he really was God, it was up to him to stop me. And I left it at that. Nothing really changed for quite a while. And then the Lord stepped in and followed through on my invitation. He did pursue me. He did stop me in my tracks. Within about six or seven months, a number of things happened. Uh, I very suddenly lost my job. I had been working with uh, the people who are in my workshop know this, um, but now I'll shock the rest of you. I was working with the Internal Revenue Service. I had been with, I heard a groan. I had been working with them for 13 years. I had a good job, a well-paying job, and a future with, with the IRS. And I lost my job literally overnight. Because I had been so careless with my money and had spent so much of it on my pleasures, I didn't have anything to fall back on. I lost my car. I nearly lost my apartment. It took a long time to find another job. When I found one, it didn't pay nearly as much. It was a very humbling experience to go through. And during that time, I had also stopped going to my church because I had given up on God. I did begin listening to the radio. And there was a radio network at that time called Family Radio. I don't know if they're still in existence. But back in 1996, they were still broadcasting the worship services from 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, the, the church that founded Harvest USA. And the senior minister at that time was James Montgomery Boyce. I'd never heard of 10th Presbyterian Church or this man before, but something compelled me to listen. And Dr. Boyce began preaching the first of a five-part series on the doctrines of grace. And I listened. And in my humbled state, the Holy Spirit began to flip on some switches. God's word began to make sense in my life. Because as Dr. Boyce described the concept of total depravity, of saying that, as I talked about this morning, every part of my being is corrupt. It's been corrupted by sin. There's nothing good in me. I actually found that a great comfort because I had been trying for so many years to improve my record with God, to get him to love me, to, to somehow impress him enough so that he would let me into the kingdom. I couldn't do it, and that's why Jesus had to come and die for my sins. I learned about the, the concept of irresistible grace where no matter how hard I sin, no matter how fast I run away from God, I can't escape his love 
I can't get away from his loving arms. He'll always pull me back. I learned about the perseverance of the saints and how once you become a Christian, you never stop being God's son or God's daughter. And the Lord did something in my heart over those couple of weeks that I listened, and then I began going to to 10th Presbyterian Church, and it continued there. The Lord began giving me a hope, a hope not that I could be good enough to God, but that God had decided to be good enough for me. He decided to give His Son, Jesus, in order that I would be made holy, in order that I would be reconciled to Him. It's the most basic gospel truth, isn't it? And I had been a Christian for so many years, and the most basic truth had eluded me. Now, finally, it was beginning to make sense. I still didn't know how things would work out with my struggle with same-sex attraction. But I started praying again. I started worshiping a tenth. And a tenth, I found out about the ministry of Harvest USA, where I began going for help. And I'll tell you, I was terrified when I walked in that door for the first time. Do you know that I I kept the bulletin from tenth with Harvest USA's number on it? I took it home. And I was determined, that was a Sunday, I was determined to call on Monday. But on Monday, I got cold feet. And I said, I'll I'll call tomorrow. And tomorrow became Wednesday. And then it became Thursday. And then it began to skip weeks and months. And it took six months for me to call Harvest USA, but I finally did. The Lord prompted me to do it. That's the only way I can explain it. I was so terrified of being told that I was a bad person, that I didn't want to call. But I finally did. And when I walked in, the staff person uh, with whom I met told me two things that really blew my mind. One was that I'm not the only Christian struggling with same-sex attraction because I thought I was. The reason I thought I was was because I never heard of any other Christian struggling with same-sex attraction. I thought all, all people in the gay life were going to hell. But he also told me that my same-sex attraction and the ways in which I acted on it were not my biggest sin problem. He was the first one who began to describe this concept of outward behavior being related to those inward idols that I talked about this morning. And the Lord began at that point repentance in my heart. I began to not only stop doing the bad outward things, but I began to submit to the Lord with the Lord rather with the bad inward things those demands for affirmation and affection and comfort and control and all the rest. Do you know where that, tree, that, uh, that diagram comes from that we looked at this morning? I made that up. Those, those are actually the sin patterns, the, the, the desires that I struggled with. And the reason they're on that chart is because over the course of being ministered to at Harvest for several years and then beginning to minister there, I realized my experience was a common one. That those desires weren't strange. Those desires weren't unique. Everyone that I encountered at Harvest USA, whether they struggled with same-sex attraction, whether they struggled with heterosexual pornography, whether they struggled with gender issues, they were all the same. But it was freeing to hear from that Harvest USA staff member 22 years ago that I 
wasn't alone, either in the way in which I sinned or the root cause of my sin. Because I realized if there were other people struggling to be faithful to God, dealing with the same things I was dealing with, then God must be doing something and there must be hope. The first couple of years were a challenge. It was difficult to put away behavior that I had been participating in for so many years. But by God's grace, it became easier. The more that I stayed away from acting out and the more that I took my thoughts and my desires and and put them under the control of Jesus, the more power I realized I had over them. And it wasn't my power, it was the power of Christ at work in me. And the temptation became less frequent and less powerful when it came. One of the ways in which the Lord moved as well is that I met up with a woman whom I had been dating prior to everything crashing and burning back in 1996. This woman's name was Susan. Susan and I met at the IRS. She worked there as well. And we actually started dating and we were actually at the point where we were talking about getting engaged when I shared with her my struggle in 1997. And it was too much for her to bear, and so our relationship ended. But just a couple of years later, in 2000, the Lord put us in the same place at the same time. We began talking. We realized that the Lord had done a tremendous work and was continuing to do a tremendous work in the other person. And so I called her back the next day and asked if I could talk with her again, and we sat down and talked again. And we decided in that conversation on that second day that the Lord was calling us to get back together and that he was calling us to get back together to get married. Who would have thought? And so nine months later, we got married. And being married to my beloved wife has been truly the most wonderful experience that I could possibly ask for on this earth. It's something I never expected 20 years ago. Marriage has not always been easy for us, especially in the first couple of years Learning to relate to a woman was difficult. Learning to engage in sexual intimacy with a woman, having had no idea that this would ever happen, was difficult. But the Lord helped us through it. We had patience with one another. The Lord used our ongoing struggles with intimacy as a way to drive us both to him. By God's grace, after a couple of years, uh, Susan conceived, and we now have a daughter who will turn 15 in a few days. We wanted a larger family. I guess my one regret is that we didn't have more children. The Lord simply did not allow that to happen. But I love my daughter and I love my wife. I don't see either of them as a trophy. I don't see either of them as uh, a reward for my repentance. They are, they are gifts, completely unmerited. I wish I could say that I were perfect. If Susan were here, and you asked her, I'm sure that she would agree that I was not. That was a joke, but (laughs) she would say that. Uh, 
because it's true. Uh, you know what? I still sin. I, I still sin in so many ways. The Lord has used my repentance in a way to show me exactly how great a sinner I am. The more spiritually mature I become, the more I realize, as Paul did, even as you see it communicated in, in 1 Timothy, where he says he's the chief of sinners, the more I realize how utterly corrupt my heart is. And it just magnifies God's grace, doesn't it? When you realize that you don't deserve one iota of grace, you, you don't deserve one good gift from God, and He chooses to love you, He chooses to give you good things anyway, doesn't that, doesn't that bring you joy? Doesn't that encourage you? I wish I could say that I don't struggle with same-sex attraction anymore, but I do. I don't struggle with it in the same ways that I did. But I'm still tempted to lust after men. I got my wish from 25 years ago when I prayed that God would give me lust for women as well. I felt back at that time that if only I could lust after women instead of lusting after men, that would prove I was straight. Well, today I'm an equal opportunity offender. But I, I think I've learned why I lust. And when I'm aware that I am either lusting or liable to lust, the Lord is very gracious in reminding me and saying, Tim, here's what's going on in your heart. You need to turn those things over to me. So, what you see before you is a work in progress. Think of this as the end of the first chapter in my life. If the Lord tarries, I will, by God's grace, continue to walk in repentance and will continue to change as his son. I, I pray that I will grow to love him more. I pray that he will use me to encourage others in the faith. And I pray in some way that the Lord uses me, my ministry, my marriage, my story, all to glorify him. He is, after all, the only one who deserves praise and glory for the good things that he has done. Now, I've shared a lot of information with you. Perhaps you can relate to some of it yourself. Perhaps you have struggled with same-sex attraction. And perhaps you have experienced some of the same fears of sharing that story with someone else because you don't know how they'll react. I, I would encourage you to not be as foolish as I was and to put that off for so many years. Reach out to someone you trust today. Let them know how you're struggling. And if you don't know to whom you can reach out, if, if there are no people that you think you can trust with this information, pray that the Lord would give you someone to speak to, and that the Lord would work in that person's heart as well And that when you approach them and say, I'd like to talk to you about something really difficult, they would say, I welcome that, my friend, because the Lord has already worked in their heart and given them the desire to listen to you and to weep with you and to strive with you. If you feel as though you are in the midst of a struggle that will never end, I can testify to you that while it may never completely end, it does change. The things that 
define you, the things that overwhelm you today will not be the things that burden you forever. And having that burden lifted is an immeasurable gift. If you have a loved one, whether it's a child, a sibling, a spouse, a parent, a friend who struggles sexually, I would encourage you to pray for wisdom and ways to know how to reach out to them, to be a friend, to be a support, to be an encourager as your loved one tries to walk in repentance. We can't do this on our own. We need the body of Christ to walk with us. And that journey with the body of Christ begins with a single relationship. It begins with your relationship with Jesus. But Jesus very quickly draws in a third person. Doesn't he tell us in Ecclesiastes that a threefold cord will not be easily broken? Once you begin sharing your struggle with another person, it becomes so much easier to bear that burden because you have someone else on the ground beginning to hold up that weight. And over the course of time, the Lord will give you grace to bring other people into that circle of accountability. And you'll realize more and more that you're not unique and you're not alone and that the Lord has called you to be a part of this wonderful entity called the church. The church, after all, is supposed to be a place where we are all sinners who have received grace, and we worship God because of who He is and what He has done. We're not called to to gather together all prettied up, with our masks on, hoping that no one will see what's really ugly inside of us. The church is supposed to be a place where we can be real, where we can be naked and unashamed, a place where we can build one another up in love, as Paul talks about in Ephesians 4.16. Will you be a part of that? Will you be a part of what the Lord is doing to build his church, to sanctify his church, to prepare his bride, to be radiant, washed with the word, and to be ready for the day of his return? Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. We ask your forgiveness for the ways in which we run from you. Lord, I pray for each of my brothers and sisters this evening that your spirit would weigh on them. And for any who are struggling with with secret patterns of sin, whether they be sexual or gender-related in nature or whether they be... Uh, any other kind of sin. Lord, I, I pray that you would not allow your children to be complacent in their fallenness, in their separation from you and from one another. Lord, begin a work here tonight that will result in many people here being encouraged that will result in many people walking in repentance, that will result in many being able to support and encourage and sympathize and empathize with brothers and sisters who do struggle with sexual and gender-related sin. Lord, I, I pray that you would glorify yourself in your church. All this we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen.